Uh, well, great. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining for our uh, second talk uh, in the Quantum Gravity Cross Approaches seminar series. Um, we're very excited to have William Donnelly today from Fermitter Institute. Uh, let me just make a couple of quick admin comments before we get started. Um, so just like last time, I would ask us to um, use the Zoom chat for any questions you have for Will during the talk. Um, and I'd ask for those questions to be mainly uh, sort of like short clarifying questions that won't take up too much of Will's time. Uh, and the moderators will uh, sort of filter those and I'll reel in to Will at natural pause points. Um, we'll save more sort of contentful discussion based questions for the end of the talk. Uh, if you want to have discussions during uh, Will's talk, I'd ask you to not use the uh, Zoom chat for that. Instead, you can use the Slack, which I think one of my co-organizers will link in the chat. Um, so feel free to discuss over there. Let's save the Zoom chat just for questions. Um, so with that out of the way, um, let me introduce Will, uh, who will be telling us about dress observables in perturbative quantum gravity. Uh, take it away, Will. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Sebastian, and to the other organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so indeed, I'm going to talk about uh, my own sort of point of view on the question of observables in quantum gravity, specifically coming from a, a perturbative approach and trying to match on to what we understand about local quantum field theory. And it's based largely on some work I did in Santa Barbara with Steve Giddings. Uh, there's a list of four papers there. I'll primarily be talking about the first two. And I'll mention also uh, some results uh, in collaboration with Don Maroff and Eric Minton and uh, with Laurent Fidel here at uh, PI. Okay. So the big question, uh, of course, is uh, to, have, to understand quantum gravity. We have two uh, excellent descriptions of our universe. We have quantum field theory, which describes most of the forces, and we have general relativity, which describes gravity. And one of the challenges that we face in formulating quantum gravity is that the two theories have very different concepts of uh, what it means to be an observable, and in particular, what it means to be local. So in quantum field theory, it's actually uh, quite simple. We think usually of locality in terms of uh, algebras of operators. So we can think, for example, of a scalar field, and we have an operator 5x, which is localized to some region. Formally, we'd have to integrate it over some region, but it's, it can be sort of arbitrarily compactly supported. And those are specified. They're, the labels of those objects are coordinates on some fixed space-time background. Uh, in general relativity, things are quite different. In particular, we don't have a fixed background. And we have a very large gauge symmetry of diffeomorphisms of the space-time manifold. And hence, observables must be invariant under those. So we can't construct simple things like 5x. And the reason is that diffeomorphisms move the points of our space-time around. So 5x, just specified in some coordinate system, is not an invariant operator. It's not something that you're allowed to talk about in the theory. Instead, we can think about constructing observables, which are specified uh, relationally of one uh, thing relative to another. And this reference system that we use could be something like uh, an asymptotic uh, reference frame, like a space-time boundary, or we could imagine coupling to some auxiliary system that we treat separately, some system of uh, clocks and rods or dust or this sort of thing that we use as a measurement apparatus to measure our system. So just to expand a little bit on the quantum field theory uh, notion of local uh, observables. Uh, the typical objects of study when you think about QFT are local operators, uh, which could be, you know, think of, which could be thought of as the Lagrangian fields of your theory, or they could be some composite objects. And we generally study their correlation functions. And 
the notion of locality uh, in QFT is encoded in this property of microcausality, which simply states that if you have operators localized at space-like separated points, then those commute. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite simple, but how is this picture to emerge? The quantum field theory is really a limit of a more fundamental theory, which is a quantum gravity theory, where we know such objects don't exist. Uh, how, how is this picture supposed to emerge? So that's the main way I want to frame this question of local observables. So the, the main object that I'm going to construct for you is what we call addressed observable. And it's defined as follows. We imagine that we're working perturbatively around some fixed background, which in this work will be Minkowski space time, but could be something else. And we think about a quantum field, uh, quantum field theory on that fixed background. And we imagine we have some operator by, let's call it phi of x. What we want to do is we want to construct uh, a dressed observable, which I'll denote capital phi of x, to be uh, a, an operator which is perturbatively diffeomorphism invariant. So it can, uh, you write it as a perturbation expansion and it, it, it commutes with the uh, generators of the diffeomorphisms with the constraints. And we demand that at leading order, it's the phi of x that we started with. So this is, and there are two ways to think about such things. Uh, one of them is that when we write something like phi of x, we have to give some kind of invariant specification of what exactly we mean by this operator. How are we measuring it? So for example, we could say phi of x, where x now isn't just some coordinate point, but is specified invariantly in some way. It's the point where certain fields take certain values, or it's a, certain, it's a point that's a certain GD's existence from something, some reference frame, something of this sort. Okay. So that's one, that's one way to think about them and is a useful way to construct these things. Uh, another equivalent way to think about them uh, is that any such operator has to map physical states to physical states, meaning that uh, if you create, if you have an operator such as phi of x, which is going to create some localized excitations, is going to create some particles. Well, the dressed version has to create also the gravitational field of those particles. And the reason these are, are equivalent statements is that both of them uh, are equivalent to the statement that the operator commutes with the constraints of the field. On one hand, the constraints, the constraints are playing two roles. On one hand, they must be satisfied by all the physical states of the theory, which is point two. And on the other hand, they uh, generate the gauge transformations of the theory, which is point one. Now, I said that there were sort of two ways to think about uh, how to construct an observable relative to a reference frame. You could use something like a matter reference frame or something like an asymptotic reference frame. Here, since we're thinking about perturbation theory around the vacuum, uh, the reference frame that is available to us is the asymptotics. Uh, so we're going to be considering uh, observables in Minkowski space, which are sort of dressed to the, to the boundary. Uh, so here's an outline. So I'm first going to review the construction of dressed observables in quantum electrodynamics, where I think things are, are more familiar. Uh, and in fact, it's, a, it's quite an old story. Uh, then I'll show how that generalizes in a very natural way to perturbative quantum gravity. And many of the same constructions uh, you can more or less copy and I'll point out what the differences are in the similarities. Um, then I want to get into what really makes gravity different from this point of view. In particular, uh, I'm going to show that there are limits on how local you can make observables in gravity and those limits are, don't apply to a theory like QED. And finally, I want to leave some maybe open questions or areas of inquiry that I'd, I'd like to know uh, more about. Okay. Uh, 
So here's a good point to pause for questions if there are any. We good? Nope, no here. questions yet. Okay. Uh, also, I don't have uh, Wait, Sebastian. I question. can't see a clock right now. So if you periodically, oh. I don't know. If I get if I'm getting close to the end, you could maybe give me. I a can hand. give you a ten minute warning if you want. That'd be perfect. Thanks. But there is a question just now, oh, um, uh, asking: Is capital phi diff invariant, but lowercase phi not diff invariant? Does this mean diff invariance is broken at some point during the g goes to zero limit? Ah, no. So what I have in mind is that. In what, what's happening in the g goes to zero limit is that gravity is being turned off. And so basically diff invariance is no longer a constraint of that theory. So I start with a non-gravitational theory where I don't need to impose some notion of diff invariance. I can just define things directly with respect to the factor number. And then what I want to, then as soon as I, as soon as I turn on gravity, I have to, uh, I have to solve the constraints perturbatively. And so that that defines capital phi. So diff invariance is, the, the, the point of the capital phi is that diff invariance is preserved uh, all along the limit g, go, g going to zero. Um, that makes sense. It's at, at any positive g, well, <laughs> it's invariant order by order. So if you take phi of x just on its own, you'll see that it will violate diff invariance at the sort of at the next order. And then, so you can construct the next order of the operator to satisfy diff invariance to some order, but then you'll see that acting on diffs, you'll then, if you just truncate the expansion, now you'll have to, uh, if you want to satisfy diff invariance to the next order, you'll have to construct a further correction uh, and so on. For uh, for us, and for the purposes of this talk, I think I'll only ever need to go to first order of these operators. But in principle, you can, well, I'll, I'll talk about what it, what happens at higher order in that G expansion, and, and even at finite G in some cases. Okay, good. So I'm going to start with QED, and I'm going to introduce two kinds of dressed operators. I'm going to introduce a Wilson line dressing and a Coulomb dressing and just see how microcausality of the uh, QFT is modified by these dressed operators. Okay. So specifically, I'm going to consider QED coupled to a complex scalar field, which I'll take to have mass M and charge Q. And I'm going to look at dressing the field operator 5x. Okay. And this is not gauge invariant. It transforms as, uh, as written here uh, by a phase under a gauge transformation. And the, uh, the potential transforms in, uh, also under this transformation. So to get a gauge invariant operator, capital phi, what we're going to do is we're going to make it a composite of 5x and a dressing factor, which will depend on the electromagnetic potential. Okay. So here's a specific construction. Let's consider phi of x dressed by a Wilson line. So, so capital phi subscript W for Wilson uh, is uh, phi of x times this exponential uh, integral of the potential going from the point uh, going from the point x out to infinity along a particular direction, which I've chosen to be z or z if you prefer. Okay. And even though I named it after Wilson, this operator uh, predates Wilson's physics career. It was considered by Dirac all the way back uh, in 1955. Um, so the very, very early days of, of QED. And just to check, just to check that I'm not fooling you, you can see how this, uh, this operator changes under a gauge transformation. The Wilson line transforms by a phase at each of its endpoints. The phase at the point x is designed precisely to cancel out the gauge transformation of phi of x. And when we define our observables relative to this frame at infinity, we are assuming that gauge transformations fall off at infinity. 
if you're concerned about the precise rate of fall off, uh, you may want to uh, smear out this operator uh, just a little bit along some, some solid angle so that it, it, uh, it decays as you go out to infinity. But that's just a detail. Good, so we've specified our operator in an invariant way. And now there's another way to think about these dressed operators, which is that they create physical states. And if you wanna see what physical state this operator creates, what you can do is you can look at the commutator with the uh, field operator. So here's the electric field operator at equal time, uh, EI of X. And I put my uh, Wilson, line X, uh, Wilson line dressed observable at X prime. And what I get is I get my original operator back times some classical electric field. And what that is, is that's a singular line of electric flux going off, going off in the Z direction. Okay. So what this means is if I act with this operator on a state, uh, it increases E, the electric field, by this amount. So, and as you can see, this is a solution of the constraints that satisfies Gauss's law. And that just follows from the fact that I defined it in a gauge invariant way. Okay, now this Wilson line is a highly excited state. If you tried to, if you act with this operator on the vacuum, what it will do is it'll create a configuration like this initially, which will then very rapidly uh, radiate It'll decay down to a more symmetric lower energy configuration. Okay. Uh, and one can construct uh, such, a, uh, such an operator, in fact, uh, Dirac did it, um, where instead of integrating over a line, you can integrate over a whole uh, time slice, a whole equal time surface. So we still have this factor, uh, except in uh, this sort of form where it's an exponential of an integral uh, smeared against the vector potential. But now the integrand, instead of being supported on a line, is supported over all the space. And the thing that you put there is, uh, is precisely the Coulomb field of a point charge. And what this does, you can do the same cal commutator calculation. And what you find is that the commutator again is proportional to the original field, but now the shift in the electric field is given by the Coulomb field of this charge. And this is in some ways a nicer configuration. The electromagnetic field you get uh, outside the light cone, you start with this initial data and it just stays in the, in the Coulomb state. So it's a time, you get a nice time dependent potential or time independent potential, sorry. Okay, good. So now let's talk about what happens to this uh, quantum field theory principle of microcausality. Well, if we construct two Wilson line dressed operators, but we choose them so that the lines are separate, at, so they're separated in space at equal time, as I've drawn here on the left, and I consider the commutator of phi with phi dot uh, of x prime, so the time, time derivative of one of them, I find that this, this commutes. It would also commute if I don't take the time derivative. Okay. But here, what is going to change is when I bring the two lines together, what's going to happen is basically because of the, because this is now a non, is now non-local supported on this line, I'm going to get a non-zero commutator when I bring the lines together. So I don't need to necessarily, I don't need to bring the points together, I just need to bring their lines together. And one can work out the commutator. And what we find is that it's, it's highly singular. So it's going to have this uh, transverse delta function. So first of all, it appears first at order uh, q squared. So recall the dressing of each of these operators is of order q. So the first uh, non-trivial commutator I get is from the dressing of phi with the uh, dressing of phi at x prime. Uh, it's proportional to the original operators up to uh, at least 
up to some corrections. And it has also this singular factor or this infrared divergent factor, which is the, the length of the, the overlap of these two things. I had to put a cutoff, an infrared cutoff, which I do know by capital Z, which is you can think of as some uh, point very far away that cuts off this integral. You can also, uh, you can get rid of this by doing some kind of smearing, as I mentioned before, smearing over some angle. But the, the, main, the main point is that it has to do with the, the fact that these field lines over, overlap. Okay. Uh, for the Coulomb fields, the commutation relations uh, are less singular. The fields themselves are less singular. And what we find is that the commutator of phi with phi dot is non-zero everywhere uh, at, at equal times. And it's given by this expression, which is uh, just nothing but the uh, Coulomb potential between two charges of Q. Okay. And actually, there's a nice way to see why that's, uh, why that's happening. What, and it, it requires you to think about these operators in, in two different ways. If, you, if I first act with one of these phi's, what am I doing? I'm creating a charge, but I'm also creating its electromagnetic field. And now when I act with the se second operator, it's defined in an invariant way, which means effectively I have to bring it in from infinity. But now, depending on which order I act, I either bring it in from infinity in the vacuum or I bring it in from infinity in the Coulomb field of another charge. And so I will depending on which way I do this, I'll, I'll either accumulate a phase or not. And that's what leads to this commutator. So it's, it's effectively the influence of the uh, electromagnetic field created by one, art, uh, one of these operators being felt by the other operator. Okay. So that's a lightning review of dress observables in QED. So I'll pause in case there are any questions at this point. No questions from the chat. Great. Okay. So next, I want to do effectively the same thing, but just in perturbative quantum gravity. Good. So here I'm going to consider a real scalar field of mass m coupled to uh, gr perturbatively around Minkowski space. So my, uh, I'm going to define kappa to be the square root of 32 pi g, just happens to be the convenient normalization, and write the metric as a combination of the background Minkowski plus kappa times a perturbation. Okay. And the factors of kappa are placed in such a way that under a linearized diffeomorphism, my field phi transforms by, by the derivative with a factor of kappa, and h transforms by the Lie derivative that leads to losing order. Okay. And this kappa being here and not here just makes perturbative GR look a little more like Maxwell uh, QED. Okay. And again, clearly phi of x is not invariant under this transformation. So we have to consider a gravitational dressing. So the simplest thing that one can do is analogous to the Wilson line. Uh, and we define a diff invariant observable starting with some, uh, some asymptotic uh, region I'll call a platform at some fixed, uh, some fixed uh, Z coordinate. I'll send a geodesic in normally from that platform and I'll measure phi at a fixed proper distance from the platform. And that's an invariant way to specify a point. And uh, at least up to diffeomorphism, uh, it's invariant under diffeomorphisms that decay sufficiently at the platform. And we can write that object explicitly in perturbation theory just by solving the geodesic equation at the linearized level. What we find is that the dressed operator 
uh, is just the original operator plus some derivative correction. This dressing factor V is now given by the integral along our gravitational Wilson line, which we've put in the z direction of the uh, Christoffel symbol the, in the z, z direction. And one other notable, so it, it's very similar to the expression, you know, where in QED you'd have a z here. The um, one notable difference is this factor of s inside the integral. So actually, the there's a sense in which the strength of the Wilson line is growing as you get farther away, and I'll ex explain that a little more shortly. Okay, and you can look at the gravitational field that is created by acting with this operator. You create an excitation, a scalar excitation at this endpoint, and it's coupled to a certain singular gravitational field um, whose precise form isn't that important. You can look it up in the paper if you're uh, morbidly curious, but it's very similar to the Wilson line. It's a highly excited configuration and it winds up expanding out at the speed of light, creating some gravitational radiation as it goes, just because this is very different from the uh, from the symmetric low energy configuration of the quark. Okay. Ah, good. And uh, like in QED, we can verify that this is invariant. Okay. Um, perhaps it's not okay. Perhaps the details aren't aren't especially important, but maybe I'll I'll note this this key feature that this this factor of S here in the definition of the dressing. What it comes from is the fact that, at, at some level, it comes from the fact that you get two derivative, two derivatives of the, uh, of the potential. And so, in order to get, you want this variation. This variation has to have, uh, has to give you back c evaluated at the point zero. So, it, this s is really just a, uh, a Green's function for this second order differential operator. That's really just how it comes about. Okay. So yeah, so one can then check that by integrating, by plugging the variation of gamma into this expression, that V transforms uh, in the way that a, basically it makes X plus V mu of X transform like a point. It moves around under diffeomorphisms in the right way, such that, uh, such that phi is invariant. Okay. So another, so that there are another, there are two other consequences of this factor of S that I, that I exp just explained. Um, so one of them is that you have to smear this a little bit more than you do in QED in order to have something, uh, in order to, to make it so that the operator doesn't create a field which is growing at infinity, which is usually not allowed by your asymptotic conditions. Um, but perhaps a more important uh, distinction is that it makes this object not symmetric with respect to its two endpoints. So in, in QED, if you just write down a Wilson line that transforms like a positive charge, say at one end and a negative charge at the other end. So you can put a particle at one end and an antiparticle at the other end. This one is fundamentally asymmetric, which has to do with the fact that you can't put, uh, well, we'll see one of the implications is that you can't put a particle at, uh, you know, positive mass particle at both ends of this object. They transform just fundamentally differently. Good. Um, so that was the Wilson line. And there was just a question in the chat. Oh, great. If it's yeah. a stopping point, um, asking, is the source the platform or a particle at the other end of the line? Ah, good. Sorry. What I mean by source, good. So what I mean by source is this phi is defined at a point x. So I didn't write the argument that there should be an x here. <laughs> okay. And that's what I mean by that's what I mean by the source. So if you'll see at, in this expression, s equals zero is the point where I put the local, the local operator I started with, the one that I'm dressing. And as you go farther away, so, so the line goes from this particle to the platform, and it's 
this factor of s, it's uh, it's smaller at the particle and larger at the platform, yeah. which I think of as being asymptotic. That was clear. Good. So now I'll, I'll proceed to show how we can construct a more uh, symmetric version of the same operator, which is in completely in parallel to the uh, the Coulomb field in QED. And so we just call it the Coulomb dressing. And now instead of so before we had the integral of the Christoffel symbol uh, in wh whose lower indices were in the ZZ direction integrated along a line. Here, I'm going to integrate over all of space. And the direction that I integrate this on is always going to be away from the particle, which I'm denoting by r hat. So r hat, it will be a unit vector pointing from the point x to the point x prime. Okay. So this is just exactly what you would obtain if you took the definition of the Wilson line that I had in the previous uh, slide and averaged it over the sphere. So the increasing factor, the, the factor of S, which made the Wilson line increase away from the source, now combines with the volume element R, R squared to give you one over R type of behavior. And now to find the field, so now we can interpret this as creating a particle type excitation plus its gravitational field. And to do that, we write a commutator between the gravitational field operator and our dressed operator. And that's going to reduce to the commutator with this dressing V uh, and will couple to the derivative of phi. So before for QED, we just had the operator phi here we have derivatives of phi, and that's just because gravity couples to the momentum of the particle. So instead of having a, something relate, you know, if I'd had a particle of charge Q, there'd be Q here. Here I have a derivative of phi, so I have momentum. Right. Um, to see more specifically what gravitational field it is, it's useful to fix P, right? So in order to interpret this as increasing the gravitational field by some set amount, that only that that's only the case if this uh, phi C is, uh, is proportional to, uh, to the derivative of phi on the right. So what I can do is I can imagine that I create a state of some fixed momentum, just hold it, just basically hold the momentum fixed. If you like, you can think of this as a large mass type of limit uh, where we only consider time derivatives of phi and not spatial derivatives. Okay. And in that, uh, in that limit, what you see is that the field you create is precisely this one, okay, which uh, up, to, up to a diffeomorphism is just the linearized Schwarzschild metric. So this is just like the Coulomb field of the uh, in QED created, uh, or the Coulomb dressed operator created a Coulomb field. Here you're creating the symmetric configuration, which is linearized Schwarzschild. Okay. And now, if you think about, if you if we now move away from the fixed momentum sector here, if we don't assume that the particle is created at rest. What we find is that our Coulomb uh, dressed operator, well, what is it going to do? Well, at zeroth order, if I just wrote phi of x and acted on the vacuum, it would create a superposition of all different momenta of particles. Okay. Here, it will, it'll still do that. It'll create a superposition of particles of different momenta, but now depending on which momentum I have, I'll get a different gravitational field. So really what, what I get is an, a superposition of different momentum states of the particle entangled with a superposition of different gravitational fields, each of which can be thought of as a boosted uh, Schwarzschild-like field. 
there's a question on that last slide or a couple, which I think yeah, are basically good. the same, uh, saying that the commutator of H and phi you wrote down doesn't itself look diff invariant. Is this just an artifact of the expansion? Uh, yes, it's absolutely an artifact of the expansion. So I should have written uh, plus order kappa squared here. Um, that's right. So you would expect that at, well, right. I mean, this phi, little phi operator isn't diff invariant, but it appears with this, uh, it appears with a factor kappa. So if, so you could continue to correct this at higher orders. If you wrote a full, you know, if you wrote two diff invariant expressions, you should get a diff invariant commutator. But here, because this is only diff invariant up to, well, is, you, you get something that's only invariant up to this order. You'd have to do, you'd have to further correct it. In particular, you'd have to, uh, you'd have to start dressing H, <laughs> the, the, the metric field as well. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Good. Okay. And just as in QED, you can see there are corrections to, uh, to microcausality, uh, and they appear just like in QED, they appeared at order uh, Q squared. In gravity, they appear at order kappa squared, which is the thing that's playing the role of, of Q, which is ordered of uh, Newton's constant G. Okay. So for the gravitational Wilson line, you get something that looks in form very similar to the QED case. We get uh, now a delta function in the transverse directions, which says that if the two lines uh, match up, uh, then the commutator is very large, otherwise it's vanishing. You get this uh, infrared divergent factor coming from the integral over the whole line. And now instead of having Q times the original operator, you get, uh, or rather, you would get Q squared times the product of the two operators. So you get a factor of G, which is kappa squared uh, up to, some pies uh, times derivatives of phi. And the interpretation of this, we can think of in a similar way to QED again. If we act with one operator phi, what it does is it creates a scalar excitation plus a very singular gravitational field that goes off to infinity. Now, when I send in another particle, I think of transporting it along this, uh, along this uh, line. If I happen to transport it along a line where this gravitational field is very different, what's going to happen is it's is I'm going to miss the original point x by some amount. I'm I'm now transporting it in a different gravitational field. It's going to be displaced in the z direction, and that uh, and that accounts for these these z derivatives. And for the Coulomb field, the story is very similar the equal time commutator of phi with phi dot. Um, okay, so it has a, a complicated expression, but just to get a flavor for what's going on, we can take a kind of non-relativistic limit where we keep time derivatives, but ignore spatial gradients. And the term that you get in, uh, in that expansion is of order G, uh, it's one over, uh, one over R, one over the distance between the two fields, and it contains uh, the, phi, uh, the phi time derivatives. So this is, a, this is a term that comes from the commutator of uh, v0 with v0. And now if I take a, the non-relativistic limit I, was, uh, I mentioned before, where phi dot is I am uh, phi, then what you get is you get g uh, m squared over r or the Newtonian potential between the two particles. So that's giving a kind of characteristic size for these uh, commutators of dressed observables. Just as in QED, the size was uh, related to the potential between two charges, the, the Coulomb potential here, it's the gravitational Newtonian gravitational potential between two masses. And just as in QED, it can be thought of in a very similar way as a gravitational redshift of one, of one particle 
being brought in from infinity in the field of the other. So I, if I first act with, with phi of x and create a gravitational, create a non-trivial gravitational field, that's going to be something like a linearized Schwarzschild solution. And now I bring in the other particle from infinity, it's going to uh, experience some, uh, some redshift, some sort of, some, uh, if you like, it's a, it's a, it'll experience a time, uh, time delay, uh, which will shift the point X. So you'll get shifts in phi proportional to the time derivative. And that leads to these phi dots, which leads to in this non-relativistic fact, uh, limit factors there. Okay. So that's the, that's the piece of the quantum gravity story that's very analogous to E and M. And I'm gonna talk about why gravity is a little bit different and why there are limits on locality, which we've sort of, which we've sort of seen some uh, some indication of already. Um, are there any questions at this point? No questions from the chat. I'll mention you have just under twenty minutes left or so. Great, thanks. Okay, good. So we we saw that when creating these dressed operators in QED, we had to extend our field lines all the way up to infinity, and there's a simple way to see that you have to create solutions of Gauss's law, which says that the total charge in some region, when, you know, by integrating, <laughs> you see that the total charge in some region is equal to the flux of the electric field at a surface bounding that region. So if you want to create a charged excitation, you'd better create an electric field that has to at least, that has to go to infinity. But in QBD, there's nothing stopping us from considering neutral operators. So we could just consider, uh, the neutral sector, and we could just write down a whole bunch of, uh, there are many possible things that we could write down that would be neutral and would not need to have their electromagnetic field extend to infinity. So for example, I could just take my Wilson line, I can put a charge at one end and I can put a opposite charge at the other end. It's perfectly valid, the agent variant operator. I don't even need particles to do it. I can create a loop uh, just to tie one end to the other or I can shrink the loop and I could create something like the local field operator. So these are the, if you didn't want to worry about, uh, about, uh, about um, electromagnetic dressing, you could just restrict your attention to these neutral operators. Okay. Uh, in gravity, it's not so simple. Um, and this has to do with the fact that, uh, oh, pardon me, that I mentioned before that if, that the Wilson line is not symmetric in the same way. So there's nothing that the transformation law of the Wilson line is fundamentally different at the two ends. At one end, you can put a scalar particle. At the other end, you have to put something, uh, well, you can't put something like a localized field, basically. So you could imagine trying to create operators that look something like this. You might think about annihilating a mass m at one point and creating a mass m at another point. Now that's clearly going to change the asymptotic field. I changed the center of mass and the asymptotic field is going to see that. I could try to be a little bit more, more clever. I could try to annihilate a pair of masses and create another pair of masses in such a way that I don't mess up the center of mass. Um, or I could try to create something like a spherically symmetric configuration, try to annihilate a shell and create a shell, or uh, here I have it annihilating, I guess, a point and creating a shell. So there you shouldn't be able to see the gravitational field of that shell. You shouldn't be able to distinguish the gravitational field of these two things. Yet still, I'm not gonna, so I'm still not gonna be able to write down operators like this. And the argument is basically just like the ar argument for QED, which is, which wound up being to write the global charges of the theory as surface integrals. Okay. So, okay. So in gravity, just to show that I did my homework here, <laughs> here are the expressions. Um, they're just the, the conserved charges in gravity are just uh, surface integrals at infinity. These are their perturbative versions. Um, the same, same things that uh, Arnowit, Desler, and Misner uh, wrote down in the 60s. So you have a, uh, an energy, P0, a momentum, Pi, um, an angular momentum, Lij, 
And KI is one that, uh, I don't know, for some reason isn't talked about it as much, but it's the generator of boosts, which is the center of energy. And the point is that all 10 Poincaré generators are, uh, are measurable at spatial infinity. So in order to, uh, in order to not have, in, in order to not have addressing, your operator would have to commute with all of these generators. Okay. okay, but the thing is, well, that leads to its own. If you try to do that, that leads to its own problems. Okay, namely, uh, so let's suppose that we construct a diff invariant operator. So here I'm calling it O, but I was calling it capital Phi throughout. And I imagine it has some perturbative expansion. So at zeroth order, uh, first order, et cetera, in kappa. And now if I start with some operator O0, which, is, uh, which isn't neutral, which has a non-zero commutator with one of the Poincaré charges, uh, then I'm going, then I necessarily, by the gravitational analog of Gauss's law, I'm necessarily going to have to have addressing that extends to infinity. Okay. In particular O1 is going to have to have some dependence on the metric. Okay. And if I have a non-zero commutator with one of the translation generators, uh, then I'll get a, a characteristic monopole, at least a char characteristic monopole decay. I can't decay faster than that. And if I have a non-zero commutator with a Lorentz generator with a rotation or boost, then you have to have at least a dipole. And the proof of this is very simple. You just consider the commutator of this operator uh, with the Poincaré generators and observe that it has to be non-zero if you want O0, uh, if O0 has some non-trivial transformation. Okay. But a corollary is that linearized gravity has no compactly supported observables. Okay. And the reason is if you had a compactly supported observable, well, it would have to commute with all of those charges. Okay. But one of those in particular is the momentum operator, which generates translations. So if you started with something that was supported in some region of your background, you could just act with it, act on the uh, on it with the uh, the momentum operator to translate it. If it's going to be translation invariant, it has to be spread out over all of space, essentially. And hence it just can't. It can't be so compactly supported. Good. So that's explain that's that's showing that gravitation that's showing, I think, in a very concrete way why gravity is really different from something like QED or Yang Yang theory um, in terms of how locality is has to be formulated. Um, this so is a perturbative a result. Oh, um, yeah, great. Um, so the question is, what if the asymptotic uh, structure, I guess, is ADS? Multipoles have the same order with monopole, right? Oh, um, yeah, good, uh, good question. I don't usually think about it. I don't usually think about ADS, but um, okay, I don't remember if they have the same order, but this argument doesn't really uh, doesn't really depend on that. As long as you have, um, basically what, what this is saying, well, the argument that it can't be compactly supported works in the same way. Um, because the trend, as long as there's some non-zero fall off, then you're not compactly supported anymore. Uh, these bounds, I actually don't know what they are in ADS, but it wouldn't be hard to look up. And probably, okay, and probably what you said is right. I don't know who, I don't know who asked the question, but I'm gonna just trust them blindly, okay. Um, and there's one other question just came oh, okay. up, yeah. um, asking, how would the linearized Riemann tensor fit the corollary? At the linear level, uh, I guess the lead road along C of RABCD is vanishing around flat space. Oh, yeah, uh, good. Yeah, so the, the issue is really in how you define um, how you define the different orders. So yeah, if you try to construct something like Riemann, which in our language is built, okay, which is gonna be some derivative of H, the reason it's invariant just winds up being basically, 
Okay, I'm not going to go all the way back to the definition of the field, but the, the metric perturbation has a kappa in it. And so really to consider something like the, the Riemann tensor, uh, if you want to think of it as a local operator constructed from the fields, if you want to think of, if you want to think of dressing operators that are based on the built out of the perturbative met metric, in order for them to have a zeroth order piece here, what you would do is you'd really consider Riemann divided by kappa, basically, which would be, and then it's trans, so it would be that object, yeah, indeed, it has zero transformation at leading order, but then you put the transformation into the next order. So in order to, in order to apply this statement, you basically have to, to the gravitational field, you just have to shift the order up one because it's defined just because of the way the, the field scales, but it, it applies this the same way. Um, so, so, in, so Riemann, um, yeah, Riemann is, you now, now need to think about the next order of the, of the transformation of the Riemann tensor where it starts being non-zero, where it will include, uh, well, <laughs> it's complicated because it's a tensor, it's gonna have a bunch of derivatives uh, acting on all the indices and then, a, well, it acts like a lead derivative. But yeah, you can you can apply this to something like the Riemann tensor as long as you scale all the fields appropriately, and it's and the conclusion is the same. Our R mu nu uh, rho sigma at x is not uh, is not an invariant observable. Uh, and I guess there's one more question on that note, uh, asking if there's an assumption that you're linearizing on Minkowski space. So does this uh, no local observables theorem hold if you're on a non-trivial background? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, actually. I'll, uh, but I'll think about that and I'll try to get back to the asker. I guess Steve is pointing out there's a dressing theorem for ADS, for example. Yeah, right. And there, there at least you have enough. Uh, thanks, Steve. There you have, it works basically the same way because you have the full group of symmetries. If you really wanted to consider a non-trivial background, you would have to, uh, you'd have to take into account the fact that the background will transform under these symmetries. So it may be a little bit different. Um, yeah, indeed, in a, in a non-trivial background, you might think about constructing something that was uh, that was defined more re relatively to the background, and you might be able to sort of hide uh, hide information a little bit better that way. But I, um, yeah, it's sad to say I don't know the answer to that question. Thanks, and I'll say you have about eh, seven or eight minutes left. Okay, uh, good. So I just want to say briefly that. Uh, one can go beyond just perturbative limits and actually put non-perturbative limits on how well things can be localized. So, so far we've been thinking about a linearized, uh, or sorry, um, well, so far we've been thinking about a linearized gravitational field of, uh, of a point, of like a point particle. Uh, and we showed that you could have something like a gravitational field focused in a, in a line. Um, but that creates a very singular configuration, and you can ask what happens at higher orders in perturbation theory, uh, or even non-perturbatively. What's going to happen as you try to go to higher and higher orders is that the line itself will have some energy density, which itself has to be uh, has to be dressed. Basically, there's some finite back reaction that you have to that you have to think about. And you can ask, okay, can you? What is there some fundamental limit? Can you really continue to fo to focus? The, you know that much energy in a single line. Okay, so these sort of non-perturbative questions are always a little bit harder, but one can simplify the game a little bit by working in three-dimensional ADS space-time. And you can see that there is a precise uh, a precise limit that you see as as follows. So if you want to create a a massive state in ADS three uh, in three-dimensional gravity, that's going to correspond to some conical defect. Of some uh, okay of some of some mass. Okay. Now you can ask on the boundary. Uh, so the boundary is a cylinder. Uh, the 
uh, boundary of ADS3 is a cylinder. And you can ask at one time, can I have an operator whose gravitational field at infinity is concentrated onto some uh, portion of the circle? Okay, so this circle has a to total two pi angle. And I want to try to restrict to some angle alpha, which is less than two pi. And the answer is there's a lower, you, uh, we showed that there's a lower bound on how much you can uh, concentrate the gravitational field lines. And it's given by this formula in terms of the mass. Uh, now, okay, minus m may look funny. This is just a normalization about uh, that you use in, in uh, ADS3, um, where the mass of defects are, so a empty ADS in the usual convention has a mass uh, negative one in these units. Uh, it's a, well, okay, in, in units of one over g, I think it's four g. Maybe two G. I, okay, it's it's a, a units of order one over G, uh, gravitational type units for mass. And m equals zero is the uh, above m equals zero. You have uh, BTZ black holes. Okay. So for a defect of mass m, this uh, this puts a limit on how how concentrated the field can be. Okay. And what happens is if you try to uh, construct states where the field lines are concentrated in a smaller and smaller region, what you find is that the total energy of those configurations diverges. So it's part of a higher order uh, gravitational effect. Good. Um, so I, I just want to point out what I think are some uh, interesting questions that this work raises. So I'll, I'll end on some, some more open-ended things. Um, so one is, a, is to talk about ADS CFP. So uh, as uh, Steve helpfully mentioned, this uh, can be generalized to, uh, to ADS. Um, and one can ask then, okay, what are the implications for ADS CFT? So in the ADS CFT correspondence, there are a number of recipes that people have uh, proposed for what's called bulk reconstruction, where you try to construct where you try to write down an operator in the bulk that in the G goes to zero limit when you're on, working on a fixed background reduces to some local operator, but you, the rules of the game are you wanna write it entirely in terms of CFT variables. So you wanna kind of write down a dictionary for local, operate, local bulk operators. Okay. And there are a number of ways to do this. So there, uh, in the early days, people considered uh, sort of global reconstruction formulas where you would have some point and you would reconstruct it as a CFT operator integrated over the entire boundary. Uh, but nowadays there are a number of, of different things. So for example, you can do entanglement wedge reconstruction where if you have just a causal domain on the boundary and there's a certain region where you can write uh, fields uh, of the bulk uh, in terms of CFT fields inside that causal domain of the boundary. So there are a number of different ways that people have, have done this, but what's, what I want to point out is that any time uh, in holography you write a CFT operator, it's automatically diff invariant. The diffeomorphisms just don't act on the CFT. There are purely a redundancy of the gravitational description. And what this means is that even if you started, even if you were thinking in leading order, uh, even if you weren't thinking about gravitational back reaction, when you wrote down the definition of your operator, if you succeed in, write down, in writing down a CFT operator, which behaves like a local field when gravity is turned off, that will automatically define something diff invariant and will automatically give you something like the dressed operators that we've described. Um, one thing I, okay, one thing I don't know is that if you take some of these recipes like entanglement wedge reconstruction, and try to uh, try to follow the dictionary uh, higher order in the small g expansion. What uh, what kind of dressings they construct? So, for example, if you construct something that's built out of a, a wedge, it must have a gravitational field that's confined to that wedge. But I don't know specifically what gravitational field you would get. It'd be interesting to see uh, just exactly what type of operators you you really are reconstructing when you're using these formulas. 
Okay. Um, okay, so flipping the sign of the cosmological constant, uh, it would, I think, also be interesting to think about the implications of this sort of thing for uh, real observations, um, in particular in cosmology. So one, uh, okay, so in, in cosmology, we, one of the, you know, mo I mean, the, perhaps the most famous thing you can, you can ask about uh, is the CMB spectrum, uh, which is effectively a two point function at the end of inflation. And it's a two point function between an, uh, an operator phi of X, which you write down as a particular combination of the inflaton field and it all uh, involve the end metric perturbations. And you construct it to be diff invariant uh, at some order. Okay. Now, if you want to, and, and um, that's perfectly fine to get uh, to get leading leading order results. I mean, it's a very successful paradigm. Okay, but now if you want to go to higher order in gravitational perturbation theory, um, you need to more carefully define your operator at higher orders. And now this is usually done through a gauge fixing procedure, okay. which is which is fine. So a, a perfectly reasonable way of constructing invariant uh, invariant operators is to say I want 5x in my favorite gauge. That itself is a gauge invariant specification of an operator. It depends. OK, so which operator you get. Of course, if I pick a different gauge, 5x is now going to refer to a different operator. It'll be a different dressed operator, which is, okay, which is also fine. But sometimes when you do this sort of procedure, the choice of gauge is a bit obscure. So in particular, the kind of things that you construct may not actually be observable. If, for example, you were to try to do something like uh, the Coulomb dressed observables or Wilson lines in cosmology, what you'd find is you are integrating something which depends on the, on the gravitational field, even outside the horizon. And so while it may be uh, observable in a, in a formal sense of being gauge invariant, it's not a it wouldn't be observable in the sense of something that you would actually see. And indeed, I, I think you can run into issues with infrared divergences coming from the fact that you wind up, uh, that these observables are defined over a large domain, which extends outside the, outside the horizon. So something I think would be interesting to do would be to try to construct dressed observables in a physical way, but in, but by shooting geodesics, for example, but using the way that the observables are actually constructed. So you could, for example, consider uh, space-like geodesics between points and this, this sort of thing. There are lots of ways that you could construct something which is formally invariant. The goal would be to construct something which is not just invariant, but also related to, to the procedure we actually use to observe these things. And, and finally, I want to talk about something that's maybe more, um, okay, pulling away from what, what is actually observable, there's something that's a more formal problem, which is how to think about locality and subsystems in quantum gravity. Uh, so in algebraic QFT, you know, if you don't have gravity, it's very natural to associate subsystems with algebras of observables, and they're associated with space-time regions. So we can label our subsystems by regions of some of our background, say Minkowski space. Say to each uh, causal domain of dependence, I associate some algebra of invariant operators localized within that region. Okay. This is fine, and one can define things like entanglement and so on in that context. Um, but now, if we want to do something that doesn't depend on the boundary, or that doesn't, sorry, that doesn't depend on the background, we don't want to use regions of the back. It doesn't make sense to use regions of that background to describe subsystems. So what should our subsystem labels be in that case? Okay. So here, what I want to propose is something, well, and, or what I want to advocate for, let's say, is a notion of subsystems, which is not 
rather than starting from a larger system and trying to identify subcomponents of it in an invariant way, to rather start from a smaller system and try to build up a theory from that. So let's imagine that instead of taking an asymptotic boundary, we actually took a boundary at some finite space. So here I've drawn a, a finite causal diamond. Okay. And now I want to associate a state space and algebra to that region. Okay. So in order for it to be localized, what I, what I want to do is I want to be able to put some kind of charged type, uh, type object on the, uh, on the boundary, on the sphere, which can, which we can think of as effectively screening the charges inside the region. So you can't screen. So these aren't ordinary. I'm not putting ordinary masses here. In the case of in the case of something like QED, you can think of them as charges because indeed you can screen charges in QED. In gravity, they have to be thought of as something else. They're more like an asymptotic coordinate system that one can. They're the things that go on the other ends of the Wilson lines. And then rather than trying to start from a bigger system and identify subsystems, we can try to construct systems like this and ask about the rules for gluing them together to make the bigger system. And the way that we do that is we want to glue them together in such a way that whatever object we use to dress, uh, to, to sort of screen out these charges, we they have to cancel out in the end to make invariant observable. So when you take something in this, a state of this region and a state of the other region, you have to be able to fuse them together to create something which is invariant in the larger region. Okay. So Laurent, Fredel, and I wrote down an explicit proposal for what this would be in GR. Okay. We came up, we found a local phase space that would have this, uh, would have this property that you'd be able to create uh, you'd be able to define a, a phase space where you could construct uh, where you could construct observables that were dressed out to this boundary. And what you find is the object you have to introduce is something like the is something like a coordinate system of the boundary. It's the location of this surface S. And so rather than being an invariant notion of, of subsystems, rather than giving a list of invariant operators in my region, what I, what I can do is I, is I keep track of the specific way in which they transform under these boundary fields. Okay. And with that specific proposal came a specific group of symmetries associated with, with this. So the, the operators that you construct are now dressed relative to this field X, and there's a group of transformations acting on X. Okay, it's the specific group. And the way that now to think about subsystems is rather than being invariant objects, they're covariant objects transforming under this symmetry. And one can now apply the machinery of representation theory, just as uh, Wigner famously did for quantum field theory, to these types of systems. One can start to classify irreducible representations and understand how those types of systems can be fused together. So just to uh, shamelessly advertise, uh, Laurent, uh, Farouk Mosafian and Anthony Speranza have a, a work on that that should be appearing shortly. Okay. All right, so I'll, uh, so just to conclude, I've shown how we can define what we call dress operators. These are perturbatively diffeomorphism invariant and they reduce to the familiar local operators of quantum field theory at leading order. What you find is that they have a non-trivial commutator outside the light cone and its natural size is of order G, the Newton's constant. Newton's constant. The, uh, anytime you gravitationally dress a compact, uh, op a compactly supported operator, you have to have a gravitational field which extends to infinity and can't decay faster than one over R. And what this suggests to me, the lack of commutation uh, is that if you want to formulate a fundamental theory in a background independent way, we really should move away from this notion of subsystems as invariant operator algebras, but really as some covariant objects. So thank you. Thank you so much, Will, for a very great 
and uh, informative talk. Join, join me muted in thanking Will. Um, okay, so uh, I guess we're a bit over time, but let's still take questions from anyone who has them. So what I'll do now is allow participants to unmute themselves. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll go ahead and call on you. Okay, so let's see. Um, we have a question from uh, Jose Diogo Simão. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Jose? Oh, maybe not. Okay, let's try uh, Hank Chang oh, instead. Okay, yeah, okay, now oh, I can. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, thanks a lot, Ruben, for the talk. I think it was really, really clear and really nice. Um, so I have an observation, I think, about the, the whole idea of constructing these REST operators. It has to do with the following, um, that it is inherently a perturbation, a perturbative construction. And unlike in the case for the particle physics gauge groups, you know, like SU2 and SU3 and U1, um, the group of diffeomorphisms is definitely neither compact nor uh, simply connected, which means that then the, the exponential map with which you make the perturbation uh, description of, of the transformations of the diffeomorphism transformations is not going to be surjected, which means that, uh, you know, however you construct perturbatively your addressed operator, I can always choose some diffeomorphism symmetry, which is not under which this operator is not going to be invariant. And you don't even have to consider uh, very exotic uh, diffeomorphisms, something that is something like um, reflections around some plane, which is not connected to the identity component, is not going to be covered by this uh, perturbative description where you look at essentially the diffeomorphisms generated by the vector fields. So then you have to come up with some justification for why you want to kind of think of observables not as gauge, not as diffeomorphism invariant uh, um, operators, but rather as the specific, uh, you know, parts of the diffeomorphisms which are connected to the identity, which is a rather small, uh, you know, number of diffeomorphisms when you can consider a lot of them, even very non-exotic ones. Um, I don't know if you've thought about that. No, this, okay, this is an, an excellent point. I don't have I wish I had something concrete to say about it. Um, it's been brought up by by a number of uh, well authors. Uh, I think ja uh, Daniel Jaffris in particular had a paper about this a little while ago, and I'm sure there are others that I'm that I that aren't jumping to mind at the moment. But it, I think it's worth emphasizing that perturbative diff invariance is really not the same as full diff invariance, and there can be uh, well, I had this very simple example of the of ADS three, where the where there are non perturbative consequences of diff invariance that aren't just that aren't visible in perturbation theory, um, and I think there are reasons to think that this uh, could be an even more um, that this could even more severely cut down on the the allowed invariant operators. Um, it's just a sufficiently difficult problem that I don't know how to, um, I wouldn't know how to do something like prove, you know, to sort of prove theorems about, about these things. It's, it's less clear to me whether, well, first of all, it's not entirely clear to me whether you need to impose invariance under, uh, under something like, uh, Diffeomorphism is not connected to the identity. It might it might be sufficient to formulate a theory that didn't have that symmetry. I I, I don't know, um, but yeah, probably even yeah, probably even even all order perturbative diff, diff invariance is much is a much stronger constraint than this you know than these sort of what are essentially first order results that I that I presented. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I was gonna I actually. At some point, considered putting that on my list of questions, but I thought it was sufficiently um, out there that I didn't think I had much to say about it. But thank, th th thanks for bringing it up. Okay, uh, there was a, ch uh, a question from the chat that we missed from uh, Gregorios Giotopoulos. Um, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask, 
uh, if you still have your question. Gregorios? Okay. No, hello. Uh, I think, I oh, think the oh, question oh. was answered in the comments. I mean, it was just whether this dressing uh, procedure really depends on the on whether the background is really symmetric. So you had these translations, for example, which you used to to show that your your support cannot be compact. For example, there are backgrounds that are not symmetric at all, or asymptotic conditions. I don't know. So that's the question, basically, whether it depends on the inherent symmetries of the formulation. Yeah, I, so I, I think I think it does. So one thing that you can do is if you break all space-time symmetries, the, so you have a back you have a background, and you, you can construct sufficiently many scalar uh, scalar objects in the background to provide a coordinate system that covers your covers your space-time, then you can just use those. You can say, I'm going to define phi at the point where, you know, re, Riemann squared has this value and Riemann cubed has this value and so on, write down a list of, you know, of those coordinates. And if you consider an operator like that, I, um, I, I think you could, I think you might be able to evade this, this kind of result. But I, I'm always a little bit uneasy with um, with things defined in this way, just because when we're analyzing a physical system, it doesn't it doesn't usually happen in a situation like that. We don't usually have a bunch of dust fields filling space, for example, that can, are conveniently you know increasing in different directions. Um, if you're doing just a scattering experiment, it's, it's happening effectively in vacuum. So, yeah, so, so while I, I definitely take the point that, uh, that the result may not, may not apply in this situation where you're perturbing around a non-symmetric background like that, I'm, I, think it, I think the case where you do have symmetries is, is more physically interesting. And you should be able to talk about things that apply in that case as well. So the kind of operators that you construct around these other backgrounds um, it's not clear that they're useful if you're describing something like scattering. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Nyaya Shafshorti, who raised his hand. Uh, hi, Will, how are you? Hey, hey Nyash. Yeah, okay, I should have given Nyash credit. I actually was talking to him that I thought about, was thinking about some of this cosmology stuff. So. That, that's okay, no, no worries. Uh, uh, so very nice talk. Uh, I have a question regard uh, after having done this, do you have a um, uh, kind of a position on the decoupling theorem that do you think UV physics decouples from infrared the in the sense that the effective field theory uh, basically people do it? Oh, um... I well, I I I don't think that this I don't know that this says anything anything new about that. I mean, really, in terms of QFT type of well, okay, thinking in in, in that kind of language of UV versus IR, really, all this is saying is something something kind of like the soft graviton theorem or soft photon theorem that. Yeah, the, the dressings, what they are is they're the sort of very soft component of the, uh, of the fields. And it's just saying that if you excite something like a local operator, which may be very UV, you, you have to, th there is still some, uh, there is some relation between the sort of hard charges of, uh, of that state and the soft charges. Right. Do you think that violates the decoupling? Um, I don't know, uh, if I knew my QFT better, I would probably have on, on, at the, on the tip of my tongue, a precise statement about decoupling, but I'd have to, I'd have to think worth thinking about basically. Pardon? I think that's something worth thinking about. I, I agree that it's something worth thinking about. Yeah. I, I, I think it's definitely saying that you can't, well, yeah, it's saying you can't ignore the, the infrared in some in some sense so yeah i think 
I think it would be worth revisiting these results. Thanks. Very nice. Thank you. OK, uh, next we have uh, Stam Nicholas. Oh, sorry, me? Sorry. Yeah. Hey, Will. Uh, I'd like to ask you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, that's uh, motivated by the last point you make on your slide. What do you have some sort of a more concrete idea what, by, by, what, by what you mean by going beyond the algebraic formulation of subsystems? Does it mean going from the algebra to the group, so exponentiating the commutators and going from the commutators that are on the algebra to some sort of to a more global defined operator that is uh, that acts on the group rather than the algebra or something else? Uh, yeah, good. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I realize I went rather quick quickly through that last part just because it was maybe more of an advertisement than a really an explanation. But I'll. I'll um, this the word algebraic here doesn't doesn't refer to the Lie algebra. What I mean is what I'm referring to is this quantum field in the sense of algebraic quantum field theory, the notion of subsystems where you associate to a region in a fixed background the set of invariant operators smeared you know with mm -hmm. smeared with functions supported in that region. Okay. So this um, so what I'm what I'm advocating is the thing. Uh, so the thing that Laurent and I talked about in in the paper that I that I referenced there. Maybe I'll go back to it. Yeah, here. Um, but really, what what it is is it's a notion of subsystem which has been very useful in uh, in topological quantum field theory. So um, the reason to think about TQFTs is because they're uh, they're really the example where we have a quantum theory with diffeomorphism invariance. Okay, they're very, they're very, they're much simpler than quantum gravity, cool. but they at least succeed in having some notion of. Uh, well, you can construct rigorously, <laughs> completely a, a diff invariant QFT, and there is a note even in that restricted case where you might think, well, a QFT doesn't have any local operators at all. Why would you, how would you even talk about subsystems? It actually does have a useful notion of subsystems and you can talk about entanglement and so on in, in topological. Oh. But it's not in terms of algebras of operators. So if you're considering something like Schrein-Simons or DF theory or one of these topological theories, you don't, uh, you don't usually think about the set of field operators supported in some region. What you think about is use this sort of, um, well, there's a kind of fancy category way of thinking about it, but really all that all that this is saying is that what is that you can divide your your space-time manifold. Uh, well, the, so the TQFT is defined as a map from manifolds into into uh, Hilbert spaces and operators on Hilbert spaces. And when you one of the things you can do in extended uh, TQFT is you can consider the Hilbert space of some region. Uh, some co-dimension one region that's like space at one time, uh, cut it into pieces and introduce Hilbert spaces to those subregions. And the way that you do that is is really just completely analogous to what Lahan and I did for for gravity. You introduce additional there are additional modes that you introduce on the boundary. So like famously, if you think about Trin Simon's theory in a region, you want to think about, not just local bulk things, but you actually want to introduce a large number of states on the boundary. Mm -hmm. um, and you think and of so it these are so, and would these also drive topology changing transitions? Because of course you can have a topological theory, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you cannot have topology changing transitions, right? Uh, well, okay, so so good. You you've. Uh, you hit right on the, the distinction between TQ, what I think is the, the important distinction between TQFT and, and gravity. Um, in a topological quantum field theory, you hold the you hold the topology fixed. So you can consider topology changing transitions, like from one universe to, to two or so on. You consider these sort of pair of pants type, type processes. Um, but you actually, in, in intermediate processes, you don't sum over topologies. Well, that's Whereas consistent. quantum gravity, I think there's reason to expect that you would. Well, you must. You could Otherwise, you get in trouble. You, you should get into trouble if you don't. <laughs> uh, right. 
So, um, so, so TQFT, I think, is a useful guide toward toward these questions, but it's not exactly the same as it's not exactly the same as quantum gravity. I, I think whatever notion of subsystems should at least be strong enough to apply to TQFT, and this is one which does. Whereas I think the algebraic one, I don't know of any way to, I don't know of any useful role for that in in a TQFT. Okay, so since we're running late, we'll just have four more questions and then we'll cut it off there. Um, so the next questions will be Steve, then Ted, then Nicholas and Philippe. So uh, Steve Carlip, go ahead and ask yours. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, basically just uh, put in a suggestion that people should look at some of the ancient literature here. Um, this idea of using curvature scalars to, uh, a, as a set of coordinates goes back to uh, Bergman and Komar around 1960. And they actually defined a non-perturbative gravitational dressing, uh, which is very closely analogous, I think, to what you're doing. Uh, and for this question of whether uh, there are local observables, I'm pretty sure that their results show at least that things like the dressed metric are necessarily non-local. But so, I'm sorry, this isn't really just, this isn't really a question, it's just a plea that some of the ancient literature in, on these subjects is really good. Uh, th thanks for the suggestion. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. OK, and next we have uh, Ted Jacobson. Ted, go ahead and unmute yourself. OK, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Ted. Hello. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I just wanted to go even further on what Stam just asked about if you have any other comments about how you would envision this formulation of local subsystems where you introduce like boundary degrees of freedom. So I, I guess I imagine a space time would be um, a collection of such regions stitched together with common boundaries. And mm -hmm. What would be the nature of the boundary degrees of freedom? Would they be quantized as well? Would I have some path integral over, I don't know, the value of the boundary uh, conditions and then some consistency condition? Or could you say anything more about more than one subsystem? Because of course the goal would be to put these together into a space time. Okay, yeah, no, um, no uh, that's a very good question and um, I see that this sort of teaser had the effect I hoped it would, which is to derail the discussion toward something a little bit different from the main body of my talk. But this is, uh, no, this is great. Um, so yeah, and, and indeed I've been very uh, vague on this set of slides. So what specifically I have in mind is we have, we introduce some set of degrees of freedom, uh, these X, X fields on the boundary, which really do uh, give you the location of a, so you can think of a space time with boundary and X is just specifying the location of that boundary. It also has a little bit of derivative information. It knows about, about the frame and the normal plane. And now what you would do in a, um, what you would do just in an ordinary, ordinary gauge theory, these things would come with some, with some symmetry that's basically just a copy of the local gauge group along this boundary. And the condition, uh, the, the rule for gluing subsystems is to use this symmetry. So what you do is you do uh, basically a quotient by this symmetry. So in the classical case, it's like, a, it's like a symplectic quotient. So the thing that you do is you look at all the generators of, of your symmetry and you match those. So for Yang Mills, this is just the electric field. So you match the electric. It's just saying the electric field has to be continuous across the cut. And then having done that, you can now mod out, you mod out the action of that, uh, of that operator. And basically what you wind up doing is if you have a Wilson line sort of dressed to the common boundary, you know, to this uh, 
to this interface where you're stitching two solutions together, um, your, uh, your, your quotient is forcing it to match up with the Wilson line on the other side to make things which are invariant of the full region. So in, gra in gravity, uh, basically by analogy, what we've done is we've found this specific group uh, which plays the role of the, of the gauge group, uh, it's diffeomorphisms and these normal transformations, and they come with specific generators. And so if you do this same quotienting process, what you do is you just identify the generators, which means you're identifying uh, some components of the geometry of the two surfaces, and then modding out by this action. Um, so are you thinking of that at the Hilbert space level, or can it be formulated in, at the level of the algebra of operators? Good. I think the most natural way to formulate it is on the Hilbert space. And, but then, because once you've done that, you can formulate the, um, whatever the, so there's some relation between the Hilbert space of region A of region B and of A union B, basically. They're related by, uh, by this uh, tensor product with a quotient. And so now you can say, okay, if I have an algebra of observables on the Hilbert space of A, the algebra of observables on the Hilbert space of B, you can relate those algebras as well. So I think in this picture, actually the Hilbert spaces are kind of primary and the algebra of sub operators are just the algebra of operators on those Hilbert spaces. And this is sort of, this is the way that you tend to work in, in TQFT as well. You don't really think about the al algebras. Of course, you always can think about the algebra of operators. You know, once you have a Hilbert space, you can always just say, I'm gonna think about the algebra of operators on it. But the thing that you, that you do, is, the way that you formulate the theory is in terms of Hilbert spaces and, uh, and maps between them. And that's kind of the primary structure. So I'd be advocating for a sort of, you know, to sort of start with the Hilbert spaces and consider the algebras as secondary. Thanks. Okay, so second to last, we have uh, Nicolas Valdez. Um, hey, Will, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I have a very ignorant question, which is uh, a maybe boring question, but from like standard QFT, I'd heard that Microcausality essentially is needed to ensure that we have a Lorentz invariant S matrix, right? Um, so why do we care about something like microcausality in, in quantum gravity? Um, well, okay, I, I, I think what I would say is we don't. <laughs> I mean, I think that would be the the, the message, you know. Okay. Takeaway is that this is really, it's really a property of of you know ultraviolet continuum quantum field theory and it's fine in the in the re, in its regime of validity but i don't um i don't think that that should include quantum gravity and there are okay. all kinds of indications so there are all kinds of indications that quantum gravity really doesn't have the same ultraviolet structure as a quantum field theory it doesn't look like a qft in the deep uv and so to have a, a, a statement like microcausality, I think is really ultimately an artifact of having a, a, a UV description. It should really, you know, it, it should be, it, it should not be taken as a, as a precise statement that would work in quantum gravity. Okay, awesome, thanks. Okay, and we'll wrap up with uh, Philip Hohn. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi, Will. Um, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, yeah, so my question is maybe somewhat remotely related to the to some previous ones on, on uh, extensions of your dress observables to higher order. Um, have you ever thought about um, these dress observables in the context of the linearization instabilities of GR and what that might entail for this? So, I mean, I guess you can do your um, dress observables also classically in principle and uh, well, um, these linearization instability. So I'm not sure if they've ever been discussed beyond uh, spatial slices, uh, beyond um, compact spatial slices, but presumably they should also hold 
I mean, that's basically a statement that you cannot extend any um, any linear solution to the uh, any solution to linearized equations of motion to higher order. And that's because basically higher orders um, impose non-trivial conditions on the physical degrees of freedom of the of the lower orders. Um, have you ever thought about anything like this in this context? Uh, no, I haven't, but it it does sound it does sound extremely interesting. So yeah, you're you're saying that because uh, that well, if you just think about the solutions, you can write down linearized solutions which aren't going to exist at higher, that can't be completed at higher orders in perturbation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so it may well be that even though, even if you have a linearized solution to, uh, to these sort of equations that define an invariant operator, even if you make a dressed operator at first order, that's not a guarantee that, it, that you could keep going in perturbation theory. Exactly, yeah. And that's indeed because the higher orders, they impose um, non-trivial, I mean, they can impose non-trivial conditions on the lower uh, physical uh, degrees of freedom. Um, so I'll say I haven't thought of that. And that sounds, I think that's extremely interesting because yeah, one of the, it, it seems like it's a, a possible intermediate step of, between this very difficult, between the, the yeah. relatively easy question of, of linearized, uh, you know, first order diff invariance. Um, it's somewhere between that and the very hard problem of non-perturbative diff invariance. Right. You know, at, at order two and order three, what what further constraints are there? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, great great question, but I don't have a I don't have an easy answer to it. Right. But sure. someone... Okay. Well, thanks so much, Will. Again, let's uh, thank Will again. And um, that was great. Yeah, and thank you to all the participants for uh, their contributions. And it's great to see how much discussion there is. Um, before we all depart, let me briefly announce uh, that because Will mentioned both ADS-CFT and uh, operator algebras, that our next talk will be by Dan Harlow on observables in ADS-CFT. And the one following that will be by Kasnia Reisner on uh, observables in algebraic QFT. So all of these will tie in quite nicely to the overall theme. Um, with that said, uh, thanks to everyone again for joining, and we'll see you in about a month, or exactly a month. Daniel's talk is on December 2nd. Okay, bye everyone.